This podcast is brought to you with the kind contribution of listeners like yourself. I do this podcast for free and would like to keep it free of adverts, but I do have bills to pay. Once a month, when you buy your coffee, downsize the cup and with the saving, toss a dollar in my virtual tip jar. You can do this by becoming a patron of the show by visiting patreon.com slash ww2podcast or going to the website and clicking on donate. I'm very grateful for your support and for those listeners who are kind enough to tip me a shilling, I have been slipping you some extras, usually little bits from the episodes that were left on the cutting room floor. So that's Patreon, P-A-T-R-E-O-N dot com slash WW2 podcast or visit the website. Hello and welcome to another World War II podcast. I'm Angus Wallace. I'd seen the 1975 film Operation Daybreak and was aware of the assassination of Reinhard Heinrich. But what I wasn't aware of was Lidice and the Staffordshire Miners. That was until Russell Phillips shot me an email. Thanks for joining me, Russell. Um, it's coincidental that we're chatting about this when the film Anthropoid, uh, which is based on the mission, has just been released. We'll get to the Staffordshire Miners, but first, let's tell the story of Reinhard Heinrich. Uh, who was he? What, what's his background? His family was reasonably well off. His dad was a composer and ran a, a music conservatory. They weren't aristocracy, but they weren't, um, they weren't poor either. So, yeah, I think middle class is probably the, a reasonable sort of term. The, the rumour about him being Jewish came about because his grandmother had married a man named Seuss. He wasn't a Jew. The name is apparently fairly common among Jews. So lots of people thought, well, obviously he's a Jew then, and that's where the, the rumour came from. At one point in the 30s, his local Gauleiter, um, which is like a German equivalent of a mayor, actually did a, um, a proper investigation into his background to check up into this rumour and concluded that there was no Jewish blood at all. That seemed to just follow them forever, really. He went into the Navy, didn't he? He did. It's funny because he went into the Navy when Shirley was the, as the military was contracting. He's not from a military background. and He decides to join the Navy. This was in 1922. This is, of course, not long after the First World War had finished. So, you know, unemployment was rife. There wasn't a great deal of money. I suspect it was simply a, as much as a chance to get something, you know, get a good job with a reasonable income. And of course, he's come from a, a reasonably well-off family, so he'd be looking for a, a good job, you know, rather than like, you know, working at the local bakers or something. He joined as an officer cadet. I, any military is obviously very strict. The German Navy of the time was particularly strict, and they had a code of conduct for their officers so that they expected their officers to be gentlemen, um, which Heinrich came up against a couple of times. And that's what ended up in the end, he was tried in a court of honour because an ex-girlfriend said that he'd made unwelcome advances on her. He said she'd been stuck. He'd said, like, you know, well, you can sleep at my place, you know. <laughs> I doubt he quite phrased it as, but the equivalent of, I'll sleep on the sofa, you can have my bed. You can get yourself home tomorrow. She said he didn't keep his hands to himself. <laughs> he tried things on and the court believed her and kicked him out of the Navy. At the time all this was happening, Heinrich was engaged to a woman called Lena. And of course, this was something of a scandal. And he had no job once he'd been kicked out. So his, Lena's parents revoked their permission to, to marry. But Lena refused to leave him. She took his side rather than the ex-girlfriend's side. So the, the engagement wasn't broke, broken off. But they couldn't get married until Heinrich got uh, another job. And that led him to the SS um, or the Gestapo. Because um, Hemler was looking for somebody to, to be in charge of the Gestapo or to help him with the Gestapo, a family friend of Lena's parents got him an interview with Himmler. Himmler was impressed, took him on. That's basically how he got into the, the sort of Nazi party hierarchy. Prior to this, he has no, I would say, uh, champion at the bit uh, political beliefs there's no you know he's not particularly radicalized he's it's odd that he sort of just picks up into he's always parachuted into the nazi regime i think he was ambitious i think that's the that's the thing really i mean when when himmler interviewed him he had no real experience of that kind of work but he had some ideas which impressed himmler 
And Lena's parents and Lena were members of the Nazi party by this time, but they joined before Heydrich did. I suspect Heydrich joined just because it was, you know, that was the way the wind was blowing. It was a good thing. If you're, you know, if you're an ambitious young German, then, you know, that's the way to get promotion and, and so on. I would have thought in 1931, at the end of the day, it's a job when there wasn't many about. Heydrich joined the party in 1931. And it was, it was shortly after that 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 he got the the job with Himmler. So how did he how did he progress within the party? Certainly within the SS, at least he he did very well. He he was promoted really quite quickly. Himmler got on really well with him. He married Lena in December of 1931, and Himmler promoted him to Sturmbannführer, which is major as a wedding gift. I haven't been able to find out exactly when he got promoted to the, the various ranks, but presumably he was a captain before he was a major. And this is within, like, about six months. It's, it's a pretty rapid promotion. Presumably the party's starting to uh, start to expand rather quick by then, because Hitler came to power in 33. So presumably if you're already in, you're, uh, you're, it's a good foot up through the ranks as, it, as the... Uh, as the party swells. Yeah, I, mean, I would imagine that the um, those people who joined before uh, everything started going right for the party would be looked on rather more favourably than those who just, you know, were more obviously joining because it's the thing to do. And as I say, I think that's probably part of the reason Heydrich joined, but he happened to do it early enough that it wouldn't necessarily look that way. Ernst Röhm was his was godfather to his son? Ernst Röhm and Himmler. Were the were Godfathers and Himmler? He had some uh, powerful friends as well. Yes, he did. What did he do? With, what was he doing within the party to, at the time? He was working with Himmler. Himmler had got the idea to start the Gestapo as a an internal security police, and Heydrich was was working with him on that. And not long after that first child was born, Heydrich's first child was born in 1933, and then in 1934. There was the Night of the Long Knives. And Hitler turned to Himmler and Heydrich to discredit Rome. Within all of like a year of naming Rome as godfather to his son, he was working against him to, to discredit him. That's, that's possibly a, a sign of his ambition that he's uh, quite willing to stab someone in the back. Yeah, it's quite a, a turnaround, you know, because as I say, you know, the, the guy was his, his son's godfather. It's, you know, it's not like somebody who he, he vaguely knew and worked with occasionally. He also becomes central in the regime when he's working with Hitler on the persecution of the Jews pre-war. I suspect that the rumours again about him being having Jewish ancestry made him a particularly keen to show that you know he was a proper German and not at all Jewish, and yeah, so he was willing to, or more willing to, help with the eradication of the Jews. He worked out quite a few of the logistics of the, because it's. It's a horrible thing to talk about in these terms, but it's, it's quite a big logistical operation to systematically murder that many people. And, and Heydrich was a big part of the, the logistics behind it. He also chaired the, is it the 1C conference? That's right, yeah. Which, of course, is... Um, Where they actually drew up the... The, the final plans and the... They drew up the final solution. I think that was where they decided on exactly how they were going to do it on a, on a big scale. And, yeah, before that, there had been... Um, murders and things, but I think the one seat conference was where they really um, set up the idea of the the big death camps and the trains taking people and all that sort of went to that sort of level. So I mean, he's absolutely central to the uh, to the regime, and he's promoted in forty one to uh, Obergruppenführer and General of Police and the new Reich Protector of Czechoslovakia. So Czechoslovakia had become Germany. Uh, pre war and they just sort of been annexed. By this point, it was more or less the modern countries of the Czech Republic and Slovakia. Because Slovakia had declared independence from the rest of Czechoslovakia in 1939. And then the Germans invaded. So let me go back a bit. The Munich Conference gave Germany the Sudetenland, which was part of Czechoslovakia, in 1938. Then in 1939, at this point, Czechoslovakia was still independent, although part of it's been annexed into Germany. Slovakia declared independence from the rest of Czechoslovakia. Germany immediately recognised the new state 
And the day after, they invaded the Czech Republic and named it the Reich Protector, Protectorate of Bohemia and Moravia, which is why Heydrich's title was Reich's Protector. So Slovakia um, was a separate a separate country at this point. So, so what, what, what's his role? He was basically in charge of, of the country. He was given the role because Hitler and Himmler and Heydrich all thought that the previous protector was too lenient and not strong enough. They sent Heydrich in to take over. He immediately organised some mass executions. Um, two of the ministers in the government were executed because they were suspected of helping the Allies. I think it's fair to say that he was evil. It's not a, it's not a word I like to use, but I think in Heydrich's case, it absolutely applies. He immediately set about oppressing the, the, the Czechs, making sure that they realised that, you know, they were under his rule and, and they were absolute to do um, as they were told and serve Germany, effectively. But on the other hand, there were some large armaments factories. There were Skoda factories um, and the Czechs made the Bren gun that the British used was, was based on a Czech design. And so the, the armaments workers got checked really quite well because he may have been evil, but he was also clever to the, the extent that some really quite big and expensive hotels got turned over to for use by the, the working classes from, from armaments factories for use as recreation facilities. Um, armaments workers got increased rations and things like that. It's a strange juxtapos- juxtaposition, isn't it, when you're going out uh, trying to execute people or executing people, which is like a big stick beating them along. And then at the same time, you've got the carrot of the uh, uh, nice hotels and things. So you're offering the workers to keep them on side and uh, keep them working hard. Absolutely. It's cold and calculating, I think, is is what it is. He knew what he wanted. Um, he basically wanted the protector to be a, a huge arms factory for, for Germany. I think it's fair to say that he saw the population as, as slaves to, to feed Germany's arms industry. It also goes to show that you know, they're not necessarily uh, slathering at the mouse mouth uh, lunatics. They're they're, uh, they're they're intelligent people, which makes it all more, which always makes them more all the more beguiling. And it's common to to refer to people like this as monsters, and and in a sense they are. But you have to remember that they're human as well, and they they can be very clever. There was a Czech government in in exile, and so they finger him as a as an assassination target. At this point, the Munich Agreement was still still valid, still in force. The British and the French had shown no signs of, of revoking it. So Czech, the Czech government was looking at this and thinking, well, assuming we win the war, and this is still early enough that it, it wasn't a sure thing, assuming we win the war, we will still have lost the Sudetenland to Germany. So they were very keen to get that overturned. And also, there was a feeling in among some of the Allies, that the Czechs weren't really fighting the Germans. There was some concern. After Heydrich takes over, you've then got a situation where the armaments factories are working well and the, the armaments workers are being trapped really well. And the, the, the Allies are going to be looking at that and thinking, well, the armaments factories are going full tilt for Germany. <laughs> it's, that's not the kind of thing an ally does. So the, the Czech government wanted they wanted to do something to to show the Allies that that there was an active resistance movement back in Czechoslovakia and that they were helping the Allied cause. And Heydrich, he was eventually selected as target because such a, a senior figure that it would make a really big impact. You know, it's the sort of thing that would really make the Allies set up, sit up and take notice. And he'd been horrifically oppressing most of the Czech population. And presumably they're in London, the Czech government. Yes, and presumably they then have to ask the British uh, for resources to run the operation. The men that carried it out were Czech soldiers who had worked their way back to Britain at some point. The Czech government had set up, with the help of the, the British SOE, a training establishment to, to train soldiers to go back to Czechoslovakia and, and work as resistance fighters. They were using their own people, but they were needing British resources. And of course, it was a British bomber that that flew over there and, and parachuted them into Czechoslovakia. And this would be codenamed Anthropoid, as per the new film. 
Um, was there already a check uh, resist? I mean, how big was the check resistance? Was there much of a resistance over there? It was quite fragmented. There were several groups. They weren't especially active. That wasn't helped by the difficulty of communications with Britain. Antipod actually got delayed because there was a single transmitter working in Czechoslovakia and that one got found by the Gestapo and the um, the men captured. So they, before it was possible to really launch Antipoid, they had to set up some new transmitters, which meant, of course, getting the men ready, getting them parachuted into Czechoslovakia, getting them set up and what have you. The Czech resistance tended to go in for less obvious and less dramatic acts of resistance. So they would try to affect armaments production, make make the armaments less effective or faulty um, and that sort of thing. So it wasn't it wasn't hugely obvious, which of course means that there's less chance of reprisals, but it also means that the Allies don't necessarily see it quite the same way. If you've got tanks rolling off a production line and they break down 50 miles in or the, the armor's a bit shoddy and they're going to be very easy to destroy, that's good but it's not necessarily obvious. It's not necessarily something that the Allies are going to see and and thank you for. It's not a big propaganda coup of a bridge going up or a power station disappearing or a heavy water plant disappearing. It's uh, it, 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 it's far more subtle, isn't it? Often when you read about these uh, SOE operations, they're parachuting into you know, uh, Norway or France or they're, you know, they're, 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 they're coming out of boats onto the beaches. Czechoslovakia is a long way inland for a plane to fly in unmolested and drop two parachutists. It is. It is. I mean, it was, um, I think it was a Halifax bomber that did the trip. They did get attacked by both flak and night fighters, but managed to, to get to survive both. But they, they got lost. I don't know if, I don't know if the pilot realized they were lost or the, the navigator, but they dropped the men. In the wrong place. Seemingly is often the case in these operations. Yeah, they were dropped quite some distance away from where they were supposed to be. As it happened, I think that probably helped them because Gabchik and Kubis, the, the two Czechs who were the Operation Antipoid team, they got themselves sort of the next morning, worked out where they were, realised that they were some distance from Prague, which is where they um, had contacts and things. So they set off for Prague. In the meantime, the Germans had noticed that this single solitary British bomber had been flying all over Czechoslovakia and hadn't dropped any bombs. So naturally enough, they thought there's something going on here. They sent out search teams. And of course, they knew where the bomber had flown. So they sent out search teams um, to cover the bomber's flight path. But in the meantime, Gabchik and Kubis are, are moving away. You know, it's one of these things that you, you have to wonder if they'd actually been dropped where they were intended to be, but that search operation had found them. Things might be very different. Did they meet up with any resistance? Were the resistance aware that they were coming or were they really on their own? The resistance were aware that they were coming. They didn't know why or what the their mission was. And they had contacts that would arrange for things like safe houses. And one of them was um, slightly injured in the drop. And the resistance found him a doctor and got him healed up. They didn't know at this point what the what their mission was or what they were intending to do. What kind of target did Heinrich make? Did he have a, you know, uh, was he you know, a huge escort, arm, armed guard escorts, or was he just driving around? Was he a soft target? Was it a difficult difficult assassination attempt to plan? Much to the annoyance of Hitler and Himmler, Heinrich had instituted rules about high-ranking officials must have escorts at all times, must be in armoured cars, all this kind of thing, and completely ignored them for himself. <laughs> His attitude was that he wanted intended the Czech population to be absolutely cowed. His theory was that if he had an escort, if he you know, if he was seen to be escorted, then that would show fear and that would show that, you know, he thought that the Czech was the Czech population was, was capable of mounting an attack on him. Whereas if he was driven around in an open topped car with a driver and nobody else, then that showed that he had absolutely no fear of the local population. And that's exactly what he did. When he first arrived in the Protectorate, he was billeted in Prague Castle, which is where he was working. But after a while, he moved out to a chateau. And so then he had a commute every morning in this open top car. And that's how the, assassin, uh, how the assassination targeted him. And if he'd still been living in the castle, it would have been a lot harder. Just as a, just a note, um, 
because you asked earlier about if the resistance knew what they were planning they did work it out they they were never told at any point officially but they captured king kubis obviously doing reconnaissance and looking at hydric's route and so on and the local resistance leaders worked out what was going on and they tried to talk them out of it they wouldn't push they were absolutely determined to do it they actually sent a message to the government in exile in britain asking them to call it off because the the local resistance leaders they foresaw the kind of reprisals that would happen if hydric was killed but the, the message came back saying nope you know the the decision's been made the operation is to go ahead what was the plan and how did it go on hydric's route there was a there's a very very sharp turn the road turns almost back on itself so the car had to slow right down to get around that corner that's where they they planned the attack now they had a, a third man with them from the local resistance who acted as a lookout and um gave them the a signal when when the car approached gabchik was positioned in front of where the car would be so as the car slowed down he walked out into the road with a stain gun pulled the trigger to fire but the stain gun jammed which i believe they were notoriously notorious for hydric being hydric and having this whole thing of not being afraid and you know the whole sort of making a show of showing the local population that he had nothing to fear from them rather than telling his driver to just drive off quickly he ordered them to stop and then he stood up to fire back at gab uh, back at gabchik with his pistol as he was doing that cupis who was behind the car pulled out a, a bomb that they had which was a a modified version of a an anti-tank mine and threw that at the car he threw it with the intention of it landing in the back of the car right where hydric was his aim was off slightly and it actually detonated just at, on the outside at the rear right of the car at that point gabchik and kubis made their getaway kubis had a, a bicycle and um gabchik was on foot hydric went after Cubis. Was he injured, injured at all? The, the bomb that went off it, some of the shrapnel got through the car, which wasn't armoured, and got Hydric in the back. Neither Gabchik or Cubis realised this. They both thought that they'd just failed completely. But both of them got away. Of course, Klein got back to the car to find Hydric in, in quite a state, leaning against the car, looking really quite badly wounded. So presumably he's shipped off to hospital... And what what kind of stit in the back of the car? in the back of the car? Is it still running? Um, no, it was a it was a paint lorry. Um, <laughs> How humiliating! Um, yeah, they basically had to lay him down on top of the the tins of paint. It can't it can't have been very comfortable for him. No. And how badly injured was he? Well, he had a fractured rib. I think the main damage was to his diaphragm and spleen. And he was he was bleeding quite quite seriously. There was some quite serious internal damage. Yeah, so he's he's quite bad in serious internal bleeding. Is there anything they could actually do for him? Heydrich arrived at the hospital, refused to be seen by a a Czech doctor. He insisted on being seen by a German, which delayed his treatment somewhat. Obviously, there was a German doctor at the um, at the local university, so they they sent for him. And initially, they thought that it wasn't too serious. It could be done under local anaesthetic. But they ordered a radiograph, which is apparently not an X-ray, but I think, to be honest, most people would, would call it an X-ray. You know, I think if you're a medical professional, you know what the difference is. And then they, they realised that actually the, the internal injuries were really quite significant, and so he needed a, a general anaesthetic. They told Hydric this, and he refused, and said that he wanted a surgeon from Berlin. They eventually managed to persuade him to be operated on by a professor from the, the local university it was a, a Silesian German and a very well-regarded surgeon. Is he still still refusing anaesthetic? They got him to the operating theatre and the anaesthetic, the anaesthetist rather, asked him the, the standard questions like, you know, do you have any loose teeth, do you have any dentures, things like this. And he refused to answer him. <laughs> Just, I, he must have been in some significant pain. I can't begin to understand why he would just simply refuse it. But they managed to get him under a general anaesthetic and operate on him. It all seemed to go reasonably well. They did the operation. It all seemed okay. Hydric came round after the anaesthetic. Everything seemed fine. When Himmler heard about all this, he ordered his personal physician to be sent down to Prague to take over Hydric's care. 
And he arrived, he looked it all over and was quite satisfied with the uh, the operation, what had been done and, and everything. For several days, he was in, he was reasonably comfortable, I think is the what the doctors always say when you're, you know, you're reasonably stable. Hydric was put into a doctor's office for use as a, a private room and the SS basically took over the entire floor so that nobody could get near him. You know, nobody could follow up and finish off the job that they'd started. And Lena was was able to visit him. He was perfectly um, lucid once he'd come around from the anaesthetic. You know, it all seemed to be going reasonably well. But then he's, there's a sort of deterioration. I mean, how's, he suddenly goes, doesn't he? It was very sudden. He developed a fever. There was some issue, you know, there were some signs that, that he wasn't recovering as well as you might expect. Gebhardt, Himmler's personal physician, didn't believe there was any need for another operation and things would be okay. And then in the early hours of the 3rd of June, he reported to Himmler that the fever and everything had, had improved, Heydrich was recovering, it was all looking good. And then round about noon that day, Heydrich suddenly went into shock. He dropped into a coma and he died the next day in the afternoon. So what appeared to be a failure to uh, Gabcek and Kubis that actually... Uh, 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 They'd succeeded in their mission, but presumably they weren't quite aware of it. And you know, this is obviously a few days later, so we've jumped ahead in the timeline. And if we, yeah, you know, we, we we left them in the story, running, running and running and peddling away. Uh, so what were they doing in the in the meanwhile? Because they think they've got a failed mission. Presumably they have an exit plan to slip away somewhere to cross the border into Switzerland. Or well, they had safe houses arranged with the local resistance, so they they headed for the safe houses. There's no evidence, though, that there was any intention of them getting out of Czechoslovakia after the, the assassination. So I think they must have intended to stay there and carry on helping the resistance. They found out fairly soon that actually Heydrich was wounded. The Gestapo made various proclamations. Karl Hermann Frank, Heydrich's deputy, issued a, a statement saying that anyone harbouring the culprits or having knowledge as to their identity or their whereabouts and failing to report it will be shot along with all their family. And Himmler had told Frank that they were to take 10,000 hostages and the 100 most important advers adversaries were to be shot immediately. And there was a, a massive um, search operation to find find the assassins. That's a, big, that's a big crackdown. Yeah, and this is all, you know, while... Well, while Heydrich is still alive, albeit wounded, but with no expectation that he's going to die. Did the Czech government in exile expect such a reaction? I think they must have expected reprisals. I'm not sure that they expected them on the scale that they happened. But by this time, I think they were well enough known in various countries that nobody could reasonably claim that they didn't expect something like this to happen. But the, the Czech government in exile was expecting and hoping that the population would rise up, that this would be the trigger for a larger resistance movement, for more obvious resistance. But that never never really happened. So where does Lidis come into this? It's a really bizarre set of circumstances, really. There was a, a young girl working in the factory. She was having an affair with a guy who wanted to break off the affair. And so he wrote her a letter which didn't outright say but implied that he was involved in the assassination attempt against Heydrich. He sent that letter to the factory where she worked on a day that she was off sick. So the factory manager opened it and read it, read it, sort of thought, it's a bit cryptic, but it's also a bit suspicious. He contacted the authorities. So the Gestapo then arrested the girl, interrogated her, found out from her who the letter was from, and also found out from her that's where the, the name of Lodica first came up, because there were two men from Lodica were in Britain, and she mentioned this during her interrogation. Now, the Gestapo obviously knew that two men had been involved in the assassination attempt, and they thought they must be the two men, and that's where Lodica first got mentioned. In actual fact, the two men were still in Britain. They were lieutenants in the RAF, and they had no clue of any of this. That's where the name first came up. When Heydrich died, Hitler was... Absolutely, he was... Incensed? Yes, absolutely. I suspect, to be honest, that he was also a bit scared because there'd been nothing like this prior to this. You know, Heydrich was, was very high up in the, the Nazi Party hierarchy 
And of course, if he's been targeted, then the likes of Himmler, Goebbels, even Hitler start to look like they could become targets. So for all that, I would never expect any of them to actually admit it. I suspect there was some fear involved as well. So Hitler basically wanted something to take his, his anger out on. He heard about this this theory that the men were from Lodica, and he ordered that it was to be completely eradicated. He wanted the people killed. He wanted the village to be completely destroyed to the extent that there would be no indication that there had ever been a village there. And he also wanted any maps that showed Lodica to be destroyed. What he actually said was that he wanted the memory of Lodica to die. He didn't just want to, the people to die or the the village would be destroyed. He wanted people to forget that it had ever existed. How big a village is it? It was just a, a little mining village. Honestly, not sure of the population, but it, was, it wasn't it was very um, very large at all. I know mean, um, some maps obviously survived. I've seen, I've got a copy of a, a map from 1933 showing it, and it's only like, you know, it's a few yards by a couple of kilometres. What amazed me was that they carried it out to the letter by physically wiping it off the face of the earth, eradicating it. But they filmed it and they publicly, publicly announced it. I don't know much about um, about other German atrocities, but I don't think I've ever heard of, of them actually telling the world about it with any of the others. They filmed the whole thing. They filmed it so that they could broadcast the film in other occupied countries. I think the idea was that it was, a, it was an example. The message was, you know, if you're trying to resist, this could happen to you. Your village could be completely wiped out. And they even landscaped the area. And there was a, a stream that ran through the village and they rerouted it so that it didn't go through the village anymore. They dug up the cemetery and took the bones away. I don't think they could have possibly done more. When you change the topography, I mean, it you know, makes any old map a nonsense because it doesn't make any, any sense. I mean, it's absolutely eradicated. What was the reaction in, uh, in Czechoslovakia? In Czechoslovakia, I think people were just scared. By the time the reprisals for Heydrich's assassination were done, there were somewhere between 4,000 and 10,000 people in total were killed in the immediate aftermath. Kind of bizarrely, Heydrich had a, a state funeral in Berlin. His coffin was put on display in Prague before it went to Berlin, and thousands of people came to to see it. I, mean, I, I would guess there's a it was a mix of reasons, but it could be that some of them just wanted to be sure that he was actually gone, you know. Some of them may have just been scared that if they didn't turn up, then the Gestapo might have been knocking on their door and going to take them away. You know, it's very, very strange. What was the world reaction in the rest of the world? Because presumably leaked copies of the film get out. All over the world, people basically defied Hitler and, and, and wanted to make sure that the Dietze wasn't forgotten. A whole load of places either renamed themselves or renamed squares, streets, um, things like that. There's a square in Coventry that was renamed. There's a a street in Hull. They've both got the deets in their name now. There are several places in, in South America that were renamed to incorporate the deets into their name. In Chicago, in Illinois, in America, at the time they were building a new a new suburb, and that got renamed to Laditza. Somewhere else in America, local people started a fund which paid for an airplane to be used for, for medical supplies and things. And that was named the Spirit of Laditza. Parents named their children Laditza. It's completely the opposite, galvanising people. It's interesting now to see that there are several Facebook groups um, about Laditza, about keeping the memory alive and things like that. And every now and then you'll see somebody post and their name is Laditza whatever. You know, the first time I saw it, I was like, well, well obviously, you know, because... Yeah, you know, I know people named their daughters Laditza, and if you've gone to the trouble of doing that, presumably you will have told them why they've got that name. But yeah, the first time, first couple of times I saw that, it was really quite affecting. And how did Gabchik and Kubis take it? Because they're still on the run. Presumably that was the last thing that they expected, and now they have uh, the blood of thousands, well, on their hands. I don't think they'd quite expected this level of reaction. And at one point they plan to and have um, placards around their necks saying that they were the ones that had killed Heydrich. And they were talked out of that. There was a lot of um, self-recrimination and, 
in the resistance generally. And that, it must be a difficult thing, a difficult thing to, to to bear. Yet they remained in hiding. They had no opportunity to escape, presumably because of the crackdown. They were still in Prague. The Gestapo were mounting a, a major house to house search, which made things very difficult for them. Eventually, they were moved to a church. The local bishop was persuaded to let them let them go there. He was rather reluctant, and eventually told them that they had to move on. But they never actually got the chance to do that. A third man who was in the resistance knew what had happened. Had managed to get out of Prague and was hiding in his mother's barn. He also had guilt about the whole thing that was going on. To be honest, his motives are are a bit murky. But he tipped off the Gestapo as to exactly who had done it and where they were hiding. He actually initially wrote them a letter. Nothing seemed to come of that. Then he walked into the local police station (laughs) and told him who he was and what he knew. I wonder if he thought he might get her away with it, walking in and giving himself up and giving up to others. He did survive. He he got the reward that had been offered. It was a, a substantial reward. And Gabchik and Kubis were in this church, and by then they'd been joined by several other Czech soldiers that had, that had been parachuted in at, at various times. None of the safe houses in Prague were very safe at that point. The Gestapo now, of course, knew knew where they were, and they um, attacked the church. It was a big operation as well, attacking the church, wasn't it? For, for a handful of resistance. The resistance fighters, presumed that they knew that if they were captured, they were going to die, and it probably wouldn't be very pleasant. So they refused to surrender. The Gestapo ended up, at one point, they used fire engines to flood the, the basement because some of the resistance fighters were in the basement. The battle went on for, for some hours. There were 700 German soldiers involved. And in the end, there were four resistance fighters left and they committed suicide. So where do the North Staffordshire miners fit in? Lodica was a, a mining community and miners have something of a bond. My dad was a miner for some years. I guess it's it's because of the, the shared danger. I guess less so now as things have become more technologically advanced, but certainly back then it was a it was a very dangerous job. In North Staffordshire, there was a, a doctor named Barnett Stross who worked with the North Staffordshire miners. And this is in the days before the NHS, of course. Quite often, he would treat them for free. So he, he knew them, the local miners. He had a quite a strong connection to them. And he reacted very strongly to the whole Lodica story. And when he heard that Hitler had said that Lodica would die and the memory would die, he decided that he was going to make sure it wouldn't. He worked with the leader of the local miners' federation, uh, a man called Arthur Badley, and they set up a, a campaign called Lodica Shall Live. Now, it was officially started in September of 1942 at a, a theatre in Stoke-on-Trent. The theatre was absolutely full, and there were people stood outside trying to listen. Basically, the local miners agreed to pay into a fund to pay for the deeds had to be rebuilt once the war had been won. And this is in late 1942 when, you know, the, the U-boats were still very strong in the North Atlantic. Dieppe was was earlier that year. I think the war was starting to turn in the Allies' favour, but it certainly wasn't... Assured. Yeah, absolutely. On New Year's Day of 1942, there had been a, a big explosion in one of the local collieries where uh, a lot of men and boys were killed and a lot more were injured. The miners were going into this less than a year after that. I mean, it, um, mining communities tend to be very close-knit. I can only imagine that, that they were still... Um, to be honest, I, I, I find it incredible that only some months before they'd had this serious loss to their own, their own people. And a lot of the miners agreed to give a day's wage each week to the fund. And a day's wage a week is... Is a significant amount of money, whatever you know, whether you're, you're well paid or not well paid. It's it's a lot of money to give up. It is a tremendous amount of money, and you know, nine forty two. There's still you, it's not as if it was a a finite amount of time. They didn't quite know how long they were going to be doing it for, and they did count continue throughout the war, a day a week. By the by, the end of the war, they'd raised thirty two thousand pounds, which. In today's money, is well over a million. When this is handed over, I mean, what, what happened after the war with the village with the fund? Once the war was over, the Czech government made some made attempts to find the people from from the deeds because they 
the men had all been shot. So the only men that survived from the deeds were the two who were in the RAF in Britain during the war. The women and kids had mostly been sent to death camps, although a few of the kids had been selected for Germanisation. So they'd been sent to SS families and raised as German children, as, as SS children, and had no idea of their ancestry. In the immediate post-war period, um, the Czech government circulated descriptions and photographs where they had them to try and find these people. And they they announced that they would rebuild the Dietze. Work was started in 1947, and there was a, a delegation from from North Staffordshire, including Barnett Stross and Arthur Baddeley, that handed over the money. And the first part was completed in 1949. At the request of the survivors, the Czech government had intended to build the new village on the site of the old one, but the survivors asked for it to be moved slightly. So it's it's actually a few hundred yards away from the original site. So the, the original site of the village is untouched and the, the new village is connected to it via a rose garden. Why is this not known? Why we, why has it somehow slipped from uh, memory? My theory is that, of course, in the in the years after that, a communist government took over in Czechoslovakia. And Czechoslovakia became part of the Warsaw Pact, came under the Soviet zone of influence. Of course, in the in the height of the Cold War, it wasn't very politic, or it wouldn't necessarily do you good to say to point out how you'd helped out the Czechs because now they're our enemy. Barnett Stross became an MP and he kept close links with the Czechoslovakia and the Dietz in particular. There are instances of debates in, in Parliament where I wouldn't quite go so far as to say that his loyalty was called into question, but people made pointed remarks, I, I suppose you, you could say, about his, his links with Czechoslovakia. I, I live in Stoke-on-Trent now. Even here, most people don't know the story it's ho- hopefully we'll have a few few thousand more will have heard of it <laughs> after listening to this because it's uh it's a f- it's a staggering story working a day a week for somewhere else in 1942 to rebuild i mean it's it's such a big uh show of solidarity when there is so so many other problems and other things that everybody else you know other bombings and the blitz and everything else yet you pick a small village that to you could be on the moon because they're it's so far away yeah in, in 1942 of course you know international travel is virtually unheard of and certainly miners wouldn't have, wouldn't have been a problem i find it absolutely incredible there are people now trying to to raise awareness again and and um make people more aware i first heard the story i was in a, a local museum with my with my son and this, this woman comes up to us and says, like, would you like to see a, a film about the Dietz and mention it was this atrocity and things? And she gave us a very brief overview of what had happened to the village. And I immediately thought of, I think it's pronounced Oradour Seglane in France. And my immediate thought was that, you know, it was something like that. And then I saw the film and I was like, yeah, and they went so much further with this one. It just, there wasn't even a ruin left after they after it finished. It was just nothing at all. It's just... And then, of course, we um, found out about the local miners and things. I was just like, how do we not know about this? You know, it's worth um, noting that for all that the story has been largely forgotten in Britain, it hasn't been forgotten in, in the Czech Republic, and especially not in Lidice. The modern village of Lidice, you mentioned Barnet Stross or the North Staffordshire miners to them. They know exactly who you're talking about. So tell me about the Unearthed Project. When I found, when I was in the museum and and heard about uh, that was part of a, a project called Unearthed. The woman I spoke to was a, um, she's an artist, and these two artists had been commissioned by the local council to make a sculpture, which is now outside the theatre where the Ladites the Shall Live campaign started. And the sculpture is filled with, or covered rather, with replicas of miners' tags. Because miners, back in the day, they each had a tag which would have their initials and the day part of their date of birth. And they would hand that in as they went into the mine and pick it up again um, as they came out so that they could keep a tally of who was in and, and who, you know, anybody who didn't come out. And as part of that, I've got a tag on that sculpture. And in order to get that tag, I had to promise to tell at least two other people the story of, of Lidice and the, the North Staffordshire miners. And I think there's something like 
three thousand tags on that that sculpture. So, assuming that everybody kept their promise, that's nine thousand people who didn't know about it before then. Well, hopefully, that's a lot more who've now heard of Ladita. Russell, thank you. Russell's book is A Ray of Light, Reinhard Heinrich, Ladita, and the North Staffordshire Miners. It's not a long read or expensive, and loyal listeners for one month can get 50% discount by going to shilka, S H I L K A dot co dot UK slash W W two podcast. So you have no excuse not to read it. Or better still, buy a few copies for Christmas presents for other people. It would be sad to see the story disappear. I'll put links on the website. To go with the book, Russell has also created a Google map. Not only does it have marked key locations such as the assassination attempt and Ladica marked, but also other places in the world that have subsequently been named after the village. Well, that's it for this episode. Don't forget, for regular updates, you can follow me on Facebook. That's WW2Podcast. And if you want to become a patron of the show, go to patreon.com slash WW2Podcast or hit the donate link on the website. Until next time, I'm Angus Wallace and thanks for listening.